Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Carl Landau, and Carl has 30-plus years of experience as a niche magazine publisher, entrepreneur, and event organizer. And Carl has launched and sold five national niche magazines and two shows. In 2000, he started an advertising sales training program called Camp Niche. These events train magazine publishers, ad directors, and ad reps how to successfully sell print, digital, and integrated sales programs. He also created a national conference called the Super Niche, specifically for small to medium-sized target audience publishers, and also runs the Niche Digital Conference, which helps publishers increase online revenues. Carl is interested in helping magazine publishers, associations, and event promoters successfully market niche events. And today, we are going to be talking on, about putting on a live event. And obviously, Carl uh, is very qualified to talk about this. Carl, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave. Uh, always nice to talk to you and, and, and have any, any connection to Austin, Texas that I can. <laughs> That's right. And every time you come down, we... Uh, we grab beer, so yeah, uh, and it's always always fun talking with you. Uh, we haven't talked in this capacity yet, but um, I'm excited to do so um, and to hear what you have to say. I've seen you, geez, we've known each other for going on 15 plus years now, and, I, I, and I've seen you really grow and keep adding new conference after new conference, and um, we want to see how you do it. So, okay. Cool. Uh, but before we dive in into your, you know, all this great advice you're going to give us today on putting on successful events, can you just first quickly just talk about some of the benefits that you've experienced from putting on these live events? Um, yeah, I mean, the thing, I was a publisher for a long time, and uh, in the day when it was just print, you know, you'd work really hard, and you'd, uh, you know, in, in our case, we had three or four monthly magazines, and you'd chip it out. And then that would be it, you know, and, and even in the digital world, you know, you'll get a comment here or there. But, like, what's really fun is with live events, um, you know, you get you get feedback immediately. So, um, uh, and it's just a way to connect your audience in a total different way. And, uh, and, and right now it's really surprising, but live events are – at an all-time high as far as mm -hmm. attendance, and I think it's sort of a backlash from social media and texting and, you know, this world where we really mm -hmm. don't connect with each other and talk to each other uh, very much, so people are really digging, you know, seeing each other at live events. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I, I've um, felt that in, in just in general, um, the world coming full circle, you know, from yeah. it going from – you know, well, no email, <laughs> you know, what, 20, only 20 years ago, right. you know, really, uh, to, you know, you know, social media. I remember when the word social media came out, right? It was, right. and then now it's just like, you know, like peanut butter, right? It's just a, it's a word. But at the time it was like, you know, what, what is this social media, right? And then, then that just took off and then it just went out of control. And now it's circling back around to, you know, people remembering, you know, don't, you know, write those thank you letters, you know, meet those people, right. shake those hands. So, yeah, what you're saying is, is everything that I've seen out there as well. So, yeah, I can definitely see that. So, obviously, um, uh, there's a big marketplace for it. So, um, getting going here a little bit, what, 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 in, what, in your opinion, is the very first thing? Uh, and let me let me also just let the listeners know is, you know, Carl, you know, he has awesome events and they're nice size, but they're not the kind of um, events that are like South by Southwest where there's like 20,000 people there. You know, Carl has started events that um, I think could could resonate with, you know, some people who, you know, an, an achievable event to put on. So um, very, very interested in, in having you help people do that because I think it's realistic um, to put on events, you know, like yours. Like, granted, there's a ton of work that goes into them. But um, in your opinion, what's the very first thing somebody should do when they consider about putting – considering putting on a live event? Like, where, where does one start? Well, I, you know, like with any venture, it's where is the opportunity, you know, and, and – uh, in in many cases, you may be in a market that has a lot of events, but it's just sort of the way niche publications have gone and, and, and you know, online publications have where you're looking for a really, um, you know, vertical niche um, that is not being served. 
So obviously in any venture, there has to be an opportunity. There has to be an audience that's interested. Uh, you need to have uh, vendors or sponsors, you know, interested in, in that audience. So it's, it's just figuring out where that opportunity is. And niche publishers in particular are in a great position uh, to put on events because you already have that audience that's already reading your magazine or reading your, you know, online publication um, and see you as this authority already and you already have advertisers in that marketplace. So it's tailor-made, uh, live events are tailor-made for niche publishers. Okay. Cool. Um, so finding your opportunities, making sure that there's one, it's even worthy of putting one on. Uh, and you mentioned reaching out to vendors. You obviously need to pay for this stuff, right? right. Um, uh, anything else to think of, you know, as we're just getting going here? Well, I mean, you're, it's, it's very similar to starting your magazine as far as, like, building out your database of prospects. Um, and also, I mean, really surveying that audience and, and trying to see what their needs are and, uh -huh. uh, and talking to as many people as you can, um, and particularly people that, like, aren't your friends or, or you know, um, that really know the industry that would have a good sense if there is a need for that or not. Because, you know, you, you don't want to start any venture, especially an event, just because it's, oh, that's something neat I'd like to go to, you know. So you uh -huh. really need to, you know, do your research and, and get as many opinions as possible um, before, before you launch. Gotcha. Now what about, you know, um and, and I, I want you, I mean, you are doing this, but I really want you to draw on your personal experience because you're, you're, you're really kind of like a carbon copy that people could follow um, and, and, and do. So I'd like to talk, have you talk a little bit about your, the team that you built. Maybe if you can think back to way back when, when you just did your very first event, it might have just been, you know, you, yourself, and, you know, me, myself, and I type of thing. But, um, and then maybe the next steps as you grew a little bit, you know, some some different tasks, some, you know, where you found you needed help. So building your team, can you, can you talk about some considerations there? Sure. Well, the great thing about events are they're, you know, not huge. I mean, as far as the staff that you need. Um, and, and as you mentioned earlier, Dave, our events aren't huge. We cap our super niche event at 250 attendees, which we normally hit that uh, number. But, I mean, on staff, pretty much we've only had two or three people, you know, and, and we run three or four different events a year. So that's sort of the beauty of events is it doesn't take a huge staff to do that. And, and also you can use consultants and, you know, uh, part-time people in, in uh, operating the event. So um, in the very first event I had, it was basically myself and Robin Ireland, who's been here for 10 plus years, and Nancy O'Brien, who was working on a consulting basis. And basically the three of us put together the first event and we had over 200 publishers at that event, which I believe you wow. were in, in Austin in yep. 2007, I think. Yeah, I think my wife was one of your helpers. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was. So, yeah. and that that is sort of a key is like getting um, people to um, volunteer to help with registration and you know being room monitors and stuff like that. But you know, people want to be associated with events because they're fun. So that part's fairly easy. Um, but basically, there's there's four components of putting together an event. It's operations. You know, as far as like everything, in our case, we we have our events in hotels, uh, but you know, you may be in a convention center or you know, you may be in the, some outdoor venue or something, depending what your event is. But there's an operation person who handles all the logistics, and there's someone who's um, handling all the programming, you know, and dealing with the speakers or, or uh, special events or whatever your programming is. There's um, marketing, um, and then there's sales, selling uh, exhibit booths or sponsorship. So basically there's those four areas, and, you know, sometimes it's just one person doing all that. But, you know, as you, as you get a little bigger, you definitely need a larger staff, um, you know, to handle all that. 
Gotcha. Now, you mentioned logistics. W what are some basic factors that, you know, you need to be aware of? Like, hey, you've got to think about this, 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 and this. And then also, w what's maybe some smaller but still very important details that sometimes, you know, might get overlooked? So, you know, you have to decide, you know, where you're going to hold this event. So, yeah, I mean, it depends if you're looking on a net, like our, our conferences are national, so it makes it a little bit more tricky. You may be doing a local event, you know, where it's a little easier because you're in that city. Um, but, you know, obviously figuring out where the venue is going to be um, uh, and the time of year and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, I mean, there's the boring stuff of contracts with hotels or convention centers or wherever it is. But, I mean, that stuff is really important. And you really have to be careful on that because the hardest thing with any new event, even though we've been doing events for 15 years, when we do a new event, you you really don't have much clue how many people are going to be coming. Um, so you have to be really conservative on your numbers because in our case, when you're working with hotels in a hotel block, those hotels take that very serious. <laughs> and if you don't <laughs> hit your numbers, uh, you have to pay for those hotel rooms. So anyone that's been involved in events has has to, has dealt with that, and it can be a sort of a scary thing. So um, that's sort of at the very beginning what what you're doing. Now, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So uh, you know, in, uh, you had said what is the one area people don't really think about, and I, I think probably the one area is networking. Um, you know, it, it's, it's the, there's two reasons why someone goes to an event. One is, especially like conferences like we do, um, one is educational, you know, they're there to learn whatever new technology or uh, techniques or, or, you know, <clears throat> information there is to learn um, about that industry and, and, you know, how to make more money doing it or, or whatever it is. Um, and then the second one is networking, and the, networking is just as important, you know, as the educational side. And a lot of event organizers just don't spend enough time really thinking about that and how uh -huh. they're going to have a structured networking, as opposed to like, oh, let's get a, um, you know, our, our, we'll have a party and like an open bar and like people just like are drinking and talking to the people that they already know. So anyway, I think that's one area that event organizers don't spend enough time thinking in advance of. Well, what have you done to help um, facilitate the networking amongst people? Because you're right, what you said is what I've experienced at some mm -hmm. and not at others, you know, yeah. um, not yours. You're, I, let me just give a shout out. If you want to have a good time and, and learn, go to Carl's events, uh, especially if it's in your, your world of digital or publishing, um, because he, he does go out of his way to make that happen. But how have you done that? Well, you know, I put myself in, in the place of someone who's never been there before, and I don't, you know, I'm not going with someone so I, we've done, we do things and it started maybe the second or third conference, but it's like um, at our lunches, we call it lunch with a stranger. And so we have a rule that you can't sit with anyone you know. Um, and, and it's really great because, you know, typically here you are, first time attendee, you know, and you're looking for a place to eat, you know, there's a, you know, 10 seats at a, at a lunch chair and, you know, there's four people there from one company and they're like talking gossip, you know, about what's going on in their company and like, sure. you know, it's, and here you are, you know, and it's awkward. So if, if everyone, um, you know, if, if everyone at the table doesn't know each other, um, it's, it's great because then they really, you know, they're sort of forced to talk to each other. Um, so, I mean, that's like a little tiny trick, but I mean, the, the lunch with a stranger has has really worked, um, and then like our welcome receptions, we do um, unusual ones where there's like activities, um, like I, I think the ones you've been to, we uh, rented out a bowling alley, or um, we've uh, we built a miniature golf course. And so my theory is if you can find something everyone's really bad at, they're sort of at <laughs> equal, they're at like a, 
you know, equal skill set, you know, because everyone sucks at bowling, you know, so, yeah. um, and then it just makes it more fun. So, you know, do have have events um, that are, you know, unusual and, and are keeping people active, like we're going, um, our, our next event, the Super Niche one, is in Charlotte in March, and we're running out the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and they have a really interactive area where you're part of a pit crew and there's like six people on a team and oh. you know and and it's it's really going to be cool so it, those are the kinds of uh, special events that we look for and it, it really sort of connects with people and they'll meet people that they would never meet otherwise you know because they're going to be thrown into some team that they don't know anyone that's yeah those are some great pointers because uh, a lot of times you go to an event Mm -hmm. And you might learn some stuff, right? You might, but you might not, you know, sit there and rave about it or talk about it to somebody if you didn't have, like, a really just good time, right? Right. And, and didn't feel that way. And that that's always, like, the forgotten thing. People sometimes just don't think about that part. And, and you have, and, and I think, uh, you know, Joe Polizzi, who's, you know, g you know, grown his conference incredibly oh, – yeah. I think he learned a lot from you, you know, because even though he's a lot bigger, just it's just a bigger marketplace, you know, marketing versus publishing. Right. Um, but it's um, a lot of the same, you know, thought process. You can see it come out in that because he Joe puts on a great time as well. So uh, yeah, you you know, but not everybody does that, and not everybody, you know, you don't get that, you know, that fuzzy, you know, you know, goodness of people talking about you like, oh my god, I had the best time. So I yeah, great pointer. Yeah, and, and I mean, and, and there's other things, Dave, that are really simple that people don't think about, but, and, and Joe does a great job of this, and is like with music. Like, you know, when you're walking into the, um, uh, you know, the conference for the first time, like having, you know, really um, fun music and getting people in a good mood and stuff like that. We've hired uh, oom pa pa bands, we've had gospel singers, we've done all sorts of things. You know, just sort of wake up the crowd when it starts because everyone's like, you know, they're, they're, today they're all texting and they're, you know, I mean, not paying attention and all that. So right from the beginning of our event, you know, we want them to know this is going to be a different kind of experience, and it and it really works. So, I mean, that's just a tiny little example, but um, music is a big deal at a live event. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you might think they're tiny little examples, but I'm telling you from, from an attendee standpoint, um, they're difference makers. So, you know, I'm hearing loud and clear is, hey, invest in some, you know, entertainment, you know, invest yeah. in some of these small things to do it. Like, you know, a, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars or five thousand dollars can, depending on the size of your conference, can go a long way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, little happy hours here and there after stuff. I mean, that's just like, don't put that money in your pocket because you'll make it back tenfold, you know, for the next year. Yeah, um, no, and, oh, oh, just one other thing, Dave, that I Please. wanted to add no. was um, just also like one thing we do and is like make it really casual. You know, we tell people don't wear, uh, you know, like a jacket and tie and all that sort of stuff. And, and um, we sort of enforce that. And I pulled people up on this stage and cut their tie and all that sort of stuff and <laughs> and it really i mean that makes people much more at ease and you know so that they don't have to pretend to be like this super professional person that they would never be in their office so anyway so okay that's why i love you carl that's why i love okay. you right there that, that, those my, that, that 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 last you know 20 seconds i mean that's that and yeah you just make people feel comfortable and now now you can see you know there's a method to to your madness there um so you mentioned you know the hotels you know they're very serious about uh mm -hmm. those blocks and you, the unknowns of starting a new conference so um, that could be scary, right? So budgeting, sure. like how did you do it at the beginning? You know, now it's obviously probably a, a lot easier for you. So don't don't tell me now. I want you to go back to the beginning when you're gone. I mean, is it a leap of faith? Like how, how did you go about that? Yeah, I, I it sort of is a leap of faith. I mean, you just don't know what, what that's going to be like. So, um, so I mean uh, – you want to be obviously really conservative. You know, I, I think our first event, our budget was like if a hundred people came, um, and so we ended up with 220. In fact, the first venue we had 
couldn't hold uh, that many people for lunch. Um, and so, but you know what? Those are problems you can deal with. The, the having too many people, you know, come or, or getting too much revenue from attendees. That those are problems you can deal with. The the other uh -huh. way, you really can't. But so if you budget for 500 people, and you only had 100 people, then that's a real problem. So. Um, just being really conservative at the beginning, and also being really organized and ready for anything um, um, is the key. I mean, you know, organization like with with events is just huge. You know, and and you know, trying to alleviate any surprises that you know um, you could have avoided. Um, that's what you want to do. Okay. Now. Um how did you first decide on what you should charge attendees? Is that just part of the budgeting, or how did you figure out what people may or may not pay, or what you feel like it's worth? Did like how did you go about deciding on that? Well, I think it's like any any time when you're looking at pricing, you want to look at competitors. So if there's mm -hmm. um, in your space, maybe there's five other like competitors in that industry, um, or going after that audience. So you know, seeing what they're offering. You know, here's a two-day conference, and you know that's similar. You know, I mean, what are they charging? I mean, that's that's what you would go about doing it. Same thing with a magazine and figuring out your ad rates and and that sort of stuff. So, um, so okay, so, just basic you know, market research. Yeah, it's basically that. But then um, you you have to be careful too. Don't start too low. I mean, we 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 start off with a thousand dollar for our event um, and uh, and it worked um, but if you if we start at 395 or something it'd be really hard to get up there so um, you know and yeah so I mean it's it's um, it, you can always go down yeah you can always go down or or whatever but um, so it's it is sort of important though that first event that you're pricing it you know, accurately, um, okay. because it's, you know, as far as going up and down a lot, that would be difficult to do. Yeah, that's, that's, you're, I don't know if you know, but you're giving some really great pointers. Um, I, I know some of these, these things might just seem like, sec, you know, just really easy for you to, to know about because you've been doing it for so long, but there's some good stuff, Carl. Now, what about, Dave, let's move on that old. Let's, let's get off the old team well, here. Come on. Well, you, 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 you <laughs> kind of are. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. You're Go looking ahead. at 30 plus years of experience. I assume you've been longer, living longer than that. Um, well, you know what? So I've almost I've been doing the same thing though since I seriously since I practically got out of college. Somehow I I got on this path of publishing. Well, you look but, young. You look thank you, you. you're a handsome, thank you're a handsome you. gentleman. Yes, yeah, you're welcome. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to speakers. It's important, right? And you you always have really good speakers at, at your events. Um, how did you go about securing them? What did you look? How did you go about that? What did you offer them? Um, you know, I want to hear the whole kin caboodle here. You know, like what did you know? Did you, you know, did you off? Did you entice them by the market? Did you entice them by paying them, or how did you find them? Just the whole thing. Well, I, I think that very first one I did like twelve years ago. Um, it was mostly I, I'd been in publishing so long. It was mostly going to my friends. You know. Um, mm -hmm. That were successful publishers, so um, so probably about half of them were just people I had known for a million years, and mm -hmm. I guess I had been nice to them at some point in my life, and and they were willing to you know donate their time and energy to do that. But anyway, so that's pretty much the first year. But um, after that, um, I you know I, as far as how we go about getting good speakers. Um, I rely on probably five or six people that I really trust in our industry that, um, you know, go to a lot of events or they have their own events um, and they're willing to, you know, share who's good. And um, so basically relying on, 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 you know, this little network of, of people that go to a lot of these events, um, that's that's primarily it, but I mean, at this point, we've had hundreds and hundreds of speakers, so you know, and, and we do a very good job of getting the evaluations and 
Um, you know, it's basically overall evaluations are like out of five. And so as far as having anyone come back, uh, you have to have at least a 4.5 to be invited back. So, you know, probably about 40% of the speaker, 40 to 50% have been speakers in the past. And then, then about half are brand new, you know, and, and there, it's all based on recommendations. But it's got to be the recommendations are someone has seen them speak already. Or mm -hmm. at the very least, you know, you've seen a YouTube video. And if someone's like a professional speaker, if they, if if they don't have like video of themselves speaking, that they're not much of a speaker. So almost yeah. everyone has at least video that you can see. And and then obviously talking to them on the phone, you know, and and seeing if they. And they're our kind of speaker, and, and you can get a sense of that on the speaker side. I'll, I'll give you a little advice, though, as far as, like, bad speakers. The the worst speakers are the ones that volunteer themselves. When I get an email, uh, someone I don't know, and, you know, I really want to speak, I'm not kidding. Uh, Dave, I tried, like, I don't know, probably six or seven times and in, in gotten those people as speakers because they really were excited and, you know, and they sounded good. But um, they, they never work out, the ones that volunteer themselves. You're, you're better off at the ones that you really don't want to speak that you have to talk them into anyway. So. Have you ever had an uncomfortable um, situation where you weren't inviting somebody back and they were wanting to go back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so what I do in that case, in the, yeah. It probably only really happened four or five times, but um, I just send them the evaluation, you know, and, and show them the comments and, and, and the evals and, um, yeah. you know, and, and a couple of them I've been able to rehab, you know, and really pointed out what the problems were. They were basically a good speaker, um, but they did something, you know, that the audience didn't like or weren't prepared in some ways or or whatever, and um, so I would say in a few cases, I've been able to help them, you know, become a you know a better speaker. And, and a couple of people I can think of that we use all the time, like the first time they were not that great. So, but in most cases, that's you know the 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 speaker is how they are, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the the one thing I really emphasize is, um, and, and this is for event organizers or to speakers, you're in the entertainment business. You know, people want to be entertained. And I'll tell you, like, you'll get someone who is a really, you know, industry industry expert and really knows their stuff, but they're really boring and, you know, they have uh, PowerPoints with a bunch of bullets and blah, blah, blah. Um, they're, not, they're not good speakers. You know, I'd rather have someone who's a great speaker who can maybe learn some of the you know the industry stuff that they need to know and and obviously we're looking for both someone who is an industry expert and a great speaker i mean that's what you're looking for but but always remember i mean you're in the entertainment business people are there to be entertained yeah yeah i mean yeah i mean you you yeah i mean i i hear you and i and i agree I, 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 the best conferences that you remember are the ones you had a good time at and you learned, you know, yeah. um, not, not, not just one or the other, you know, the ones that you, you go, you continue to go back, you get, you, you get both. So, yeah. um, let's, let's move on a little bit to, um, promotion. Um, what, what are the best ways you've promoted, you know, that you've found that works really well for you on your, your promotion for your events to, to get attendees and attendance? Well, uh, for that super niche event, which used to be called the Niche Media Conference, we just renamed it um, this year, but um, we've always had a theme, and that seems to really help in the marketing. So uh -huh. um, this year's theme is NASCAR, because we're in Charlotte, and the NASCAR Hall of Fame is there. Um, what are in you the past, be Yeah, in the past, we've done, like I said, bowling. Um, we were in... Phoenix, and it was during spring training, so the theme was baseball. Um, we did one where it was pop culture. That's when I dressed as Austin Powers, and you know, yeah, part I of that. yeah, part, part of the magic, let's say, of niche is me dressing in some ridiculous outfit that 
Um, That's what I was somehow, asking. What are you going to wear for NASCAR? Well, I, I, we're, we're building a special, like, NASCAR suit as we speak. Um, <laughs> it's sort of funny, and, and we're putting, actually, the – logos of the sponsors on my suit and you know just like they do in nascar and and all that oh, sort of stuff. So, good idea. yeah so um anyway so the themes really help and uh help us so um and because it really differentiates you from all these other you know conferences where they're pretty boring and and that sort of stuff and you know i mean you talked about joe polizzi and I mean, it was genius where he came up with the whole idea of everyone dressing in orange because, I mean, that uh -huh. orange is his favorite color. And, you know, it just makes a huge difference. People just feel good when they're walking in because they're in this, you know, um, in that case, orange outfit or whatever. But in our case, we get people dress up in, in whatever the theme is for the party or, or even at the event. So, um uh -huh. But as, as far as marketing, I mean, the the key is your, like anything, is your list is really doing a great job of um, putting together the prospects. And, um, you know, it's and, and obviously at this point it's all email and social media as far as, like, mm -hmm. getting people to attend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, you know, start off with, you know, have a hook. Get your, get your uh, theme. Uh, right. So you can kind of already start showing people it's going to be fun, and mm -hmm. then and then just a lot of the. I mean, we this isn't about marketing too much, so we won't get into all promotional right. marketing stuff. But in general, though, your your best advice there is build build your marketing in and around the theme, so that you know something to remember, something to get people excited about. Okay, now um, to kind of circle back around, we talked about this a little bit, but. Um, you know, well, we haven't talked about this specifically, but you talked about you know estimating low and and for budgeting. But how how did you estimate a turnout? I, I can imagine that just seems like the grandest of of, of tasks to do yeah. if you're just getting going. Like, how did you to do? How did how does one even think about going about you know doing that? Well. The the key thing is is getting registrations early. So ours are national events. So I mean, you really want to um, have like your first deadline really early. If it's a local event, you know people are more used to registering like closer to the event. That to me, that's the scariest thing. People that have like these, you know, local events that you don't know until that day. You know who's going to show up or if it's rainy that may affect things and and you know uh, that sort of stuff so um so w what we do is um just to get things going and to get an idea of what the attendance is going to be like we offer like a pre-programming special price um that's mm -hmm. a heavily discounted registration and we actually call it pre-programming pricing or something like that and um that's about six months about five or six months in advance of the of the event and we probably get about twenty to twenty five percent of our attendees at that point and, and is that a number that somebody can uh, you know approximately rely on like these early bird specials you're looking at that might indicate about twenty to twenty five percent of your total um attendance is that I know you. I don't want to put you too much on the spot because I don't want you. you know, I know you don't want to lead anybody astray. But is that somewhat accurate? Well, well, for us it is. You know, you're going to have other audiences where they don't care about the price. You know, so it may not serve everyone well. But for us, basically, we and I came up with this. I don't know, probably about ten years ago, where we actually offer this four different deadlines um so there's the pre-programming deadline which is like probably um like six hundred dollars off i mean that's um we we do a two-day conference and an add-on so um that for three days it would be like six hundred dollars off and then we go to super early bird pricing which is maybe four hundred dollars off and then early bird which is like three hundred dollars off and then regular pricing so so the thing is, um, unfortunately, we're in an industry that's very deadline-oriented as far as the events uh, business. So 
So it would be too scary to have one deadline, you know, like one early bird. So that's why we give people a chance like three times at a deadline. And that, anyway, that that helps us figure out how many people are going to be coming and how are we doing number-wise versus last year and, and that sort of thing. Okay. Now, moving on to, like, securing vendors, is there any mm -hmm. pointers you have there? Um. Well, I mean, it's sort of funny, that very first event we did 11, 12 years ago, that was like a last minute thing I thought of. And I only sold three sponsors for that, and I really didn't even try that hard. I just didn't know the, that the vendors very well at that point, um, and, and was really concentrating more on the attendees. And it's sort of funny, we went from three and we charged like $7,500 to $10,000 for a sponsorship. So we went from three in the second year, we had 20. So, <laughs> and, and the way we got it really was, and I'm not actually giving, this is not great advice right now, but I mean, I pretty much relied on the attendees to like, go to their vendors, it's like, well, this is an amazing event. You know, they'd go to their printer or their digital edition provider or their CRM, you know, um, provider. And, and, and you know, they just pretty much on their own, they went to their own suppliers and said, you really should be going to this, you know, niche conference. And so, like like I said, this is not great advice. I mean, you need to be more proactive in general. Yeah. But I was pretty much a one-man show. I didn't have time to make a bunch of calls to to vendors. Now, now, I mean, we've gotten way better at all that. And, I mean, our sponsorship for the super niche is, like, way up. I mean, because uh, I've spent more time, and it's a well-established show at this point. But, um Anyway, How did you so, go about like knowing which vendors would make sense? I know some of it's logic, like oh, it just makes sense. But is there anything like any advice you can give there? Like think sure. about it this way. Yeah. So, so I mean, basically, you know, we'll look at like ten other publishing conferences, and you know, I mean, you see who the sponsors are, and add them to your prospect list, and and you know, they're all there. I mean, so if someone's if someone is a sponsor or exhibitor already at a um, conference within your industry, they're, you know, your best prospect. So that's not that hard to come up with the prospect list. And gotcha. then, and then you know, what, I, I probably get more sponsors, um, new sponsors from my existing sponsors that just tell other vendors, this is a great show. Um, uh -huh. Because... They all know each other, you know, and they're, they spend a lot of time. If you're an exhibitor at, I mean, um, we don't have booths. We just have tabletops. But, you know, at a bigger event, if, if, if you have a booth, there's so much downtime for them. And they just sit and talk, you know. And, and, and the, you know, the sponsors that we did have really loved it and loved the audience. And, you know, we got a lot of business out of it. And so uh -huh. it pretty much word spread, you know, within the industry that this is a really great place. And this is – these niche publishers are sort of an ignored audience that no one knows who they are, you know, because they're yeah. these goofy vertical magazines that unless you were in that industry, you wouldn't know these – these um, most of the publishers. So anyway, that's, uh -huh. that's how we've gotten it. What about uh, once it's over, um, any strategy you have to keep vendors coming back um, or signing yeah, them up? Our, our renewal up? rate is close to 90%. So um, uh, what you want to do is renew them on site. So the last day we have renewals all set to go, and um, the, most of them sign up right there. And you want to do it then because obviously, you know, they're there. And and they're excited, you know. They had some success. Mm -hmm. They met all these, you know, new publishers that they they never knew. And 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 so that's what you want to do is hit them up right, you know, for renewals right on site. I and mean, do you schedule those step. appointments, those renewal those renewal points before the event starts? Like no, at, on no, we point. do it. I mean, for okay. So if you had a large trade show. It's an entirely different deal, you know. If you had like, you know, two, three hundred 
um, mm-hmm. booths and, and what you do in with because I have run a couple of trade shows and you have a whole area uh, dedicated for the sponsors where you, where you have like snacks and drinks and stuff like that and you schedule appointments uh, with them and it's usually based on uh, how long that they've been a um, sponsor exhibitor and then they come one by one and you bring them in and you show them where the booths for next year are and you know that whole thing so gotcha. um that that's pretty typical for a trade show Our, ours are you know 25 sponsors so i mean literally i just do it myself and just walk around and give them the um the agreement and just hassle them for a little bit and that and they sign so anyway <laughs> Good, yeah, i don't I mean, know if that's I, helpful I, I, or not that. yeah i mean I've, I've read that multiple times just get in front of them and hassle them that's the one two punch <laughs> All right, now, uh, what about your, your time? Like, how how, um, how far ahead of time should people expect to, you know, be able to successfully put one of these together? If it's, a, if it's a national conference, um, really, minimum is one year out. Okay. Um, if, it, if we're talking about a brand-new event, um, mm-hmm. because – People, you know, they they start scheduling out, you know, attendees and and um, sponsors or vendors. Um, so, it, and it's really it is very difficult to sell sponsorship and all that for a first time event, you know, because everyone's like, well, I don't know what this is like, and you know. Um, can you send me a list? And it's like, there's no list. I mean, we haven't done this before of like who's going to attend or anything like that. So, I mean, once you're established, you know, in, in, like in our case, we've started a bunch of new events and, and the, 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 um, sponsors know what to expect, even at a new event, uh, you know, have some idea, but like, if you don't have any track record, it, it is difficult selling the, sponsorships at the beginning. But but anyway, sorry. Uh, so time-wise, a uh, year in advance uh, for an event. And then I, I'd say for a local event, probably more like six, seven months in advance. Okay, cool. Awesome. Now, um, we're running a little short on time here, but I'd like to get your advice on when things go wrong. You know, what, what sort of contingency plans have you put in place? Like, Dealing with snags like potentially speakers not showing up or sound systems not operating, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, you know, where can people be proactive in in dealing with potential issues that could pop up at the last second? Well, I mean, we've been really fortunate on the speaker side. I think we've only had one or two speakers that were not there, and that was purely because of weather; they couldn't get there. So, um, you know, the key with it is with everyone is keeping everyone informed. Like we do a really good job of emailing on a regular basis, the attendees, the speakers, the sponsors, on, you know, where we stand and, and, and all that. So, and then they feel comfortable in contacting us, whatever's going on. So I think communication is the key as far as like keeping everyone on track. Um, as far as like AV not working or all that, well, well, first thing, I, and I've seen that happen a lot, um, and that usually is because they didn't do a sound check and, you know, didn't do all the precautions that you need to do. I've seen that so many times. So most of those bad things are just they, they weren't fully prepared. Um, but occasionally it does happen, and, and, and when I – what I say is, like, if there is a problem, as long as they see the event organizer working hard, you know, and they're concerned about it and they're, um, you know, uh, doing whatever they can, I think people are very, you know, uh, willing and, and understanding of, uh, of things that go wrong. So um, in our case, we're pretty lucky because almost everyone that attends our events um, also puts on events, <laughs> so they've seen it all themselves. So they're actually pretty understanding. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, uh, any parting thoughts? I mean, we, we've talked about a lot, or do you have any good resources, blueprints to point people to um, for putting on events, or do you have any, any last parting thoughts before I uh, have, to, have to let you go? Well, um, we 
as far as putting on events, um, this will be our third niche event fest, and it's an event about putting on events, and that's going to be oh, the first okay. day of Super Niche, and it's Charlotte, uh, March 27th. And we're going to have about um, 80 event organizers at that. It's a one-day event before um, the Super Niche. So, okay. um, so that's a good resource. We are putting together some eBooks this year, and one of them absolutely is going to be a step-by-step -step checklist of events. So I think in about two, three months we'll have that available. Um, well, where, where uh, would they go find that? Well, uh, God, like everyone in the world, we are re redesigning, redoing everything on our uh, websites. So, mm -hmm. in a in a let's see, in a in a week. So by the time people are listening to this, uh, if you go to niche, uh, let me see, it's uh, niche media HQ, like headquarters dot com. Um, okay. That's where all our information and that's where all of our content will be housed. Um, anyway, um, okay. so and if you have that white paper, yeah, send it, send it over and we'll, um, sure. we'll, we'll put it in the blog that we uh, write up for this. Um, yeah, awesome, awesome, man. You gave some awesome pointers. Um, I really, really appreciate you and your time. Uh, how, how else can people continue to learn from you? Um, well, I mean, we have a blog um, that we'll be producing from that. I mean, you can get it through that site, so um, it comes out three times a week, of which usually about one in four of our blog posts um, are about putting on events. The rest are about okay. you know, helping um, niche publishers, so um, that's it. Or, you know, you can email me at carl at niche media hq like headquarters dot com and I I respond pretty quickly. And um not surprising you not surprisingly your Twitter handle is niche media man, correct? Right. Right. Yep. <laughs> so you can follow Carl at Niche Media Man. Well, Carl, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh I sure. really appreciate uh, all, all the great info and um until next time. Okay, I really appreciate it, Dave. You've been a good friend and, and you know, you're doing a great job with uh with the publishing community and, and the social media community, and I, we all appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. You're okay. welcome. Okay, man. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.